All right, let us say hello once again to Colby Chaos Covington, a little less than two weeks removed from his unanimous decision win over Jorge Masvidal at UFC 272. Look at this bling. Look at this setup. Unbelievable. Colby, welcome back. How are you, my man? I'm doing great. How, how can I not be good? I'm living the American dream, Mike, so I'm thankful to everything that I have and the reason I have it, the people that you know fought for our freedoms, the military first responders and all the good people out there, so... God bless you all. What are we wearing here? Like, uh, wh- where do we get these these chains and the, this this chaos thing right there? I mean, look at that thing. Like, where do we get this stuff? Yeah, the, the inspiration behind a lot of this was the media, man. They, they were talking shit about me. So I wanted to show them that, you know, I could buy a house and I have more on my neck on my neck than they have in their house. So, you know, I, I had to I had to start out on these haters, all these all these John Morgans out there that can't even do 10 push ups. So. You know, I had to let him know that, you know, you could talk shit and say I'm undeserving, but w- what the fuck are you deserving of? Well, let's I mean, there, there's so much to talk to you about right now. Uh, let's just talk about what happened with this whole setup and the fight week in particular, because you and I have been talking for a while. You've wanted this fight for a while. You've called for it many, many, many times. And it finally happened. And then, then we see the storytelling, the friends to enemy storyline, the build to it, the promos, all of it. And it all culminated over those 25 minutes. What was the build like for you? Because I know you don't do a lot of media these days unless it's fight week or maybe like a few select chats after these fights. But how would you personally describe the build to this fight? Were you happy with it or were you kind of over it by the middle of fight week? No, I was I, I loved it. You know, I love being a UFC fighter and, and do a big business for Hunter Campbell and Dana White. Got a lot of respect for those guys and 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 what they allow me to have opportunities for. So it, it was awesome. You know, the Stephen A. Smith buildup was hilarious going on his show. And just just hearing how heated and, and mad George was, because he knew he couldn't stop me. So he was just going to act like a little kid and not, not try to let me talk because he knows I'll make him look stupid if we're doing talking because the guy's uneducated. He didn't gradu- graduate middle school, Mike. So how is he going to be able to compete with, you know, an all-American D1 stud who got a college degree? You know, I'll run laps around him. So the buildup was amazing. The UFC did a great job. They they put it on all their channels. They put it everywhere. And, you know, they put the whole thing for us. You know, they put the platform dedicated to that fight and building this. So it got a lot of run. And and I'm thankful that I won another title, the King of Miami title. That's a legit title. I'm getting coronated this weekend in Miami. And that will be a thing going forward. You know, I'm the King of Miami. So it was it was a great build. And it was fun. You know, there was no pressure on me. You know, I knew how what I'm capable of and how good I am. So it was just another easy night in the office. What do you mean you're getting coordinated in Miami this weekend? What, what's happening? Yeah, I'm getting my, you know, I'm getting my throne. I'm getting my King of Miami title. You know, we're going to have a little celebration. There's going to be some Mama Cita, some other things. So everybody's got to stay tuned because I promise you the unveiling of this is going to be absolutely comical and, and just pure entertainment. Wow, that's great. All right. So stay tuned for that. I thought I thought the promo video that actually aired a week before the card actually happened was really well done. I thought it was one of the best promo videos the UFC had put together, in my opinion. I, I thought they did a great job of that. And you mentioned the Stephen A interview. So kind of fast forwarding to the press conference, because that was one of those things where there is no gray area. You thought it was the best press conference ever and it was perfect for the fight or you thought it was just awful and it was a tough watch and it was just really tough to deal with. Did you enjoy it? Like the face off the bells and whistles? Like, did you enjoy that part of it? Because it was, it kind of reminded me of the Stephen A interview in some ways, but it was just, it was just kind of different and kind of got off track a bunch of times. It was amazing. And I had so much fun with it. You know, it's, it's always fun when you can just be honest to the world. Like, the world, there's no platform to expose people and, and say facts. And I'm just, I'm so happy that the UFC gives me such a big platform to to speak, you know, from the heart and speak facts. You know, it's not, I didn't say any lies, Mike. I said honest truth. And, and sometimes it's brutally honest and it hurts. But you know what? Facts don't care about your feelings. So I'm, I'm going to talk about facts and I don't care about people's feelings. And, you know, I, I could see how, how mad he was because he knew he couldn't do anything about it. But, you know, at least he tried. 
You know, he, he came out and actually tried, but he knew he couldn't do anything about it. So he was just pouting like a little let a, a little kid and trying to interrupt me and not let me talk and, and get my point across. So let's get into the day before the fight and heading into fight day, because I'll be honest, when you are in the field that I am in, you hear things and some you believe wholeheartedly and you dig for the truth. You, you see, you smell the roses, if you will. And others, they're more like rumblings and you just don't know. And you wonder how you kind of approach hearing this information. But I heard rumblings on Friday night about the knee Colby I had heard there was a knee injury and I'll admit I was watching the walkout closely I was watching the leg kicks closely from Mazadal early on it looked like maybe they were having an impact but I heard there might be something and then you're asked at the post-fight press conference and you said that you leaked this information out there as kind of a, a loyalty test of sorts and apparently this person failed so when, when did you plant that seed and when did you know that your plan was executed and someone kind of went behind your back and and did what you thought they might do yeah mike about two and a half weeks before the fight i was doing one of the medicals that we had to do uh to get cleared to fight i think it was like the eye exam or they had to come take some blood or something like that and i just i knew that george had went through this place before this 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 wellness center so uh I knew that this guy was kind of splitting in between and he had some loyalty, loyalty to this guy, you know? So I gave this guy some information to see if, if it would get back to them and, and it did. So, you know, I think, uh, mission accomplished, uh, it served its purpose for, for what it meant to do, but people don't give me credit for, for setting traps on these rats, but you know, I'm catching all these rats <laughs> and exposing them. That's a, <laughs> it was a brilliant move when I heard you say it. So there was no knee injury at all. This is all a big work. It's all a big work. Didn't have no knee injury. I was completely healthy. I mean, none of those leg kicks did any damage. That was weak. You know, I, I left that fight without a scratch. So, you know, I just, I played a game of chess. All these guys are playing checkers, Mike. We're playing chess. Brilliant move right there, I got to say. So let's let, let's talk about the fight itself because, you know, like we said, the leg kicks are happening. The fight is getting going. And then the accidental eye poke happens. And Mazadal is telling Herb Dean about said eye poke. Herb doesn't call it. You jump in there, you put him against the fence, you take him down, and you just, and you win the round. So, walk us through that. Did you feel the poke? Were you surprised it wasn't called? No, I didn't. I didn't feel the poke. I don't know if the poke happened, but I was just in the heat of the moment, and, I, and you know, trying to trying to punch this dude's face off. So, it, it didn't make any impact. We go right up against the cage, and we were kind of stopped for a second. Then I went into my wrestling. He wasn't going to stop what I was going to do. I mean, he had twenty five minutes to try and stop what I was going to do. He couldn't do it. He was defenseless. He gave up. He just. He was just – he didn't want to get finished. That was his big thing is not getting finished. But he still got marked up, almost finished against the cage. And I, I outstruck him by double the outstrikes. You know, I beat him striking. I beat him wrestling. I beat him everywhere. The guy's, the guy's a, a, a journeyman. Like I said, I said all these things. I said truth about him. You know, he hit lightning in a bottle. He's a two-pump chump. He doesn't have cardio like the cardio king. He can't keep up, you know, with the greatest American fighter of all time. So, uh, it, you know, it was an easy night. It was a flawless victory, Mike. The momentum of the fight just kind of went in your direction right there. I thought you won the second round. I know one judge scored the second for him, but we missed like a whole minute of that round watching it here in the United States because the stream just went away for like a minute. So, I mean, from what I saw, I, I scored it for you, but who knows what happened in that minute. But third round, I thought it was a 10-8 third for you. Like none of the judges agreed with me, but I know I wasn't alone there. If you go to the, some of the websites and you even go to, to MMA fighting, like we scored it a 10-8 round for you. When that third round ended, what's going through your mind? Because you have to feel like all-time high confidence. You have all the momentum after 15 minutes of that fight. So usually, you know, Street Judas, phony Montana, Masvidal is handing out three pieces and sodas. I'm handing out 50-44 in a soda. So I'm dominating him every single round. I, I knew I was it was complete domination. I heard the, the announcers in the third round. They're like, yeah, that's a 10-8 round. Even like, you know, uh, Bisping and... and and it wasn't D.C. I think uh, whoever else was on the call, I think it was Anik, and they were even saying they thought it was a 10-8 round. So everybody knew it was just complete domination. I won every single round. I mean, he didn't win one round. He had one judge who gave him one second round, but the two other judges scored that round for me. So I beat him every single round. Flawless victory. Easy victory. I can't believe the UFC paid me to do that. I used to do that for free, Mike. I used to do it every Tuesday and Thursday at, at the gym, American Trash Team. So, you know, to get paid to do that and get paid – Man, what a, what a dream come true. God bless America. The fourth round, Mazda lands the shot everyone's been talking about and looked to have you stunned a little bit, and the round ends, and pretty much 
everybody again, even all the judges, even though he landed that punch, they still gave you that round. What happened there? What happened there with the punch? Was this, did he just land something? Like it was just a flurry that you weren't really prepared for? Like what happened there? No, I, was, I was off balance. I mean, I, I've watched that back and you can even go, look, I'm like circling to the left and I kind of just caught, I mean, he hit me with a punch, but it wasn't like a powerful punch. The dude hits like a bitch. So he hit me with a little tiny punch and I was honestly going to the left. So my feet just got caught up and tripped. I barely even like just stumbled and then I got my my footing. That's why he didn't come after me because he could see in my eyes I'm still there. Right before that, a minute before that, I had him up against the cage with a flurry of punches and almost had him finish. Like I seen the eyes roll in the back of his head. So that was a legit almost finish. You can't talk about the one punch he had. He made his he made it his uh, Instagram and Twitter main picture. That's how butt hurt and that and deep in his feelings. And he knows he's my little bitch and I'm Jorge Masvidal's father that he is, that he made the, the one punch he landed the whole entire fight, and I was off balance. He thinks that's a big deal, dude. I got right up and was right in his face, bomb, jab, jab, bomb, right in his face, stippled him, and he just went to doing what he does, bitch, crawl up against the cage like a little fucking clown. I thought that moment was the most interesting moment in the fight, but not for the reason that everybody else did, because the whole storyline going in was these guys know each other so well, like... I mean, well, how are they even going to approach this fight? But the point I kept trying to make was like three years is a long time. Like there's a lot of time for growth and you do different things. You've gone to different gyms. He approaches things differently as well because that punch lands and he admits like he's really tired in the moment. But at the same time, he said to the media after the fight that like he thought you were just going to shoot for a takedown right away. Like as soon as like you kind of went back, you're just going to shoot for a takedown. And he was staying patient, waiting for the takedown. So my thought process was like even heading to the fight. Yeah, these guys know each other so well, but like I said, both fighters are much different. And I felt like this is the first time in that fight where that theory might have been tested. The history meets mystery crossroads, if you will. Did you think of it that way as well? Because you feel like, I mean, it was, it was just a shot. You got knocked off balance, but I mean, he didn't come after you in that moment. Were you surprised by that? He tried to come after me. You have to go rewatch the tape. He tried to come after me and I put a punch right in his face and I was... I was solid. Like I wasn't wobbled. He didn't hurt me. It wasn't like a bad punch. It, it was literally off balance and, and, and hitting me at the same time. I mean, I literally, it was a trip on my own self. So it, it, he knew he, he could tell he, he's like, dude, yeah, he's not, he's not hurt. That didn't hurt him at all. You know? So, you know, I, I beat him in, in the striking department. I doubled his output and strikes more strikes to his face. I completely outclassed him, Mike. I mean, if he wants to talk about one punch in 25 minutes, okay, let's talk about the end of the 25 minutes. Did you not see that guy? hanging on the fucking security guard <sighs> just can't even literally walk because he's so exhausted and he's still like flipping out oh fuck you call me i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna get you like, come on bro dude can't even fucking speak can't even walk he has two people holding him up i'm i'm there i'm fresh I, like i didn't even get in a 25 minute fight imagine if someone isn't pulling me off of him Imagine if we're in the streets, Mike, I'm literally taking his life. His life is over in that moment. So, you know, he knows his soul got taken and his life's over. And the king of Miami's here, Kobe Chaos Covington. Yeah, you could tell, I mean, the, the punch, it didn't have much of an effect, if, if any, because you go out there, like you said, you finish the round and fat, you finished the fight emphatically. I, I scored it again, another 10-8. I scored it 50-43. It was on Twitter. Uh, I mean, I think one judge gave you a 10, eight for that fifth round, but he said what he had to say afterwards, but you ended the round in dominant position. You're on top, you're landing punches until the horn sounds, but right after the horn sounds or right before it, I think you, you start saying stuff to him and that whatever you said to him, got him really upset. Like that's what he was up and and saying what he had to say back. What did you say to him as the, as the fight ended? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's right. I'm still your daddy. You can't do nothing about it. You're, you're my bitch and I'm the king of Miami. And he just, he, he, you know, he took that to heart, but it was just so funny. He gets up, he's like stumbling, like trying to talk back to me. And I'm just laughing deep down inside. I'm just like, bro, you have no chance and you know it deep down inside, but you're just, you, that's just your ego and your pride. You can't not just fucking keep chirping. And, and at least he's going to try, you know, like Dustin Poirier, he's scared of me. He's probably not going to try. He's going to take the loss. Dustin Poirier is going to have the, the fastest loss. It's going to be a Guinness World Record in UFC history. Zero seconds of round one verbal submission by Colby Chaos Covington. Dustin has the fastest tap out in UFC history. So at least George tried. 
You know, he, he he had a little bit of honor for himself, and he actually came out and actually tried. But Dustin, he has no honor or dignity for him or his family. He doesn't respect his wife or his kid or his team. So, you know, he's not even going to try. So he, he's got to look in the mirror every day and know he's a coward. So I, you brought it up, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you about it because – the Poirier call out, both you guys are obviously in, in interesting spots right now and things have been said in the past. There's some heat there between you two guys. You have similar histories as, as you do with Mazadal, but you mentioned, you know, I, I, like it's become a big topic since the fight because people, fans, media, et cetera, like they liked the call out from a competitive fighting, let's settle it standpoint. Like no one, everyone likes the fight. Like everyone thinks it makes sense. The issue people seem to have and you kind of brought it up there was the way you may have went about it, like bringing in the family, the child, all that stuff. Maybe you cross the line. That's how some people are talking. So I just wanted to, you know, since you brought it up, sort of offer you the chance to respond to that, those criticisms, if you don't mind responding. I mean, the criticisms are, let's talk facts for, from the fight purpose perspective, first off, you know, he claims to be this top 10 pound for pound fighter, one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. Okay. Why don't you fight a guy that's actually at your weight class, Dustin? He weighs more than me. We used to step on the gym at American Trash Team every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. He would weigh more than me. He was like 185, 188. I'm 182, 183. So I, I'm just not a weight bully. I don't want to cut all that weight to lightweight. It's just too much. It's too much sacrifice in my life. I want to enjoy my life and eat my meals and not miss meals. So he's a weight bully, Dustin. He, he's claiming to be – he's number one in his weight division. He's saying his bulk in season, he wants to come up a weight. He's trying to fight the guy that's crippled. Nate Diaz, the guy has a list. He's trying to fight that guy, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to fight the number one guy at 170, he, but he wants to fight some other guy that's crippled and, and handicapped in the corner. Like, why are you fighting that guy? That guy doesn't do anything. Like, he's going to fight someone else anyway, so come fight the number one guy. He said hopes and dreams, title aspirations. He wants to talk like he's some pound for pound fighter. And, dude, it's not like I'm trying to trying to call on someone that didn't call me out. Dude, if you wouldn't use my name, Mike, I, I would never have even talked about it. But when you use my name for a little clickbait and, and headlines to say it's on site with me and try and act like you're some tough gangster in the streets, bro, we can fight anywhere. He has all these stipulations for us to fight, Mike. I just got one stipulation. Just let the world watch and enjoy themselves. We can go do it in a park if he wants to get dropped on his head and – and be in a coma where he can never see his wife and kid again, but he can also just come fight me and get paid by the UFC and get, take his ass whooping like a man, but he's got, he's not a man. He's, he's a little kid and he's going to put his pride and ego before his family and before, you know, the, the honor and dignity of his team and, and friends. So that's pretty sad, man. It shows what kind of person Dustin is, but he's taking it out one way or another. I'm not really worried if he doesn't want to fight, he's still a bitch. Anybody I fight, Mike is going to be a headlining marquee, a big pay-per-view fight, you know? So, uh, and, and talking about his family, I mean, dude, he uses his kid as a prop. Oh, I'm a dad. I'm this. Uh, oh, he uses his wife, puts her on the camera. He throws them out there. Why are you throwing them out there to sell your business? This is cage fighting, Mike. We're getting locked in the cage to hurt each other. I'm going to send that guy to the hospital and try and take his life away, take his soul. So let's not talk about, you know, words that hurt people's feelings. Let's talk about, you know, uh, actions and just people acting the way they do. As far as the Mazadal victory goes, where, where does where does that one rank for you? Like, if the Colby Covington biography gets written, what chapter is is this fight going to be in? Yeah, it's it, it'll be up there in one of the chapters. You know, it's a uh, it's a great one because I started the guy's career and I got to end his career. So that's that's such a great feeling and such a good feather in the cap that you know it's going to be a good part of history, a good part of my legacy and, and the sports history and legacy. So. You know, it corrected what was wrong with the universe. That guy's wrong with the universe. He's a piece of shit, deadbeat father. He's he's not a good person. He's a criminal. He's grand theft charges, went to jail, never graduated middle school. And he pretends like he's he knows politics and he knows what's best for America. Bro, you're scamming off the government, George. You got PPP loan. Like, I thought you were rich in this. Why are you using the government handouts and loans? And he was using an Obama phone when I used to live with him, Mike. So you're using an Obama phone and trying to get me to do food stamps, but I never kept the food stamps. Even though I was completely broke, I never took them. I was always like, no, I don't want food stamps. I feel like I'm cheating the system. I want to work and earn it the hard way, the blue collar American way. So I'm not like George. The guy's a piece of your person. And and I'm glad I was the one that got to expose him and fry him out in front of the world. Would you ever fight him again? Like, is would anything entice you? Like, if I know you, you, you the pay per view points like didn't really matter. You said you'd fight him for free, but if the UFC offered you like a 
if they offered, did they backed the Brinks truck up and offered you a whole bunch of money, would you fight him again? Yeah, he can get beat up again, man. He can get put out unconscious this time. You know, that was my worst performance and his best performance, and he still got starched every single round. So if he, if the fans want to see me put his lights out for good, and, I mean, if we see each other, he knows that we see each other in the streets. He's talked too reckless. Like, he's going to get beat up there as well, drop him on the concrete. But the UFC won't be able to pay his medical bills, so hopefully he'll get another UFC fight. But, you know, I'm open to anything. Any, the biggest and best business that Hunter Campbell and the UFC want to – do that i'm ready to do and i'm excited and, and i'll be very ready they know how hard i work and how much better i get every single day so your friend chael sonnen who you know quite well created some buzz on your behalf because you know talking about the poirier thing he discussed sort of the place that you're in you know usman might be fighting leon edwards next that seems dana white said today that that's probably the fight they're going to make when usman's hands are ready to go then there's the burn shamaya fight coming up in a couple of weeks so if the poirier fight can't happen he Uncle Chael suggests Israel Adesanya needs a foil and is he starting to fight guys a second time? You could be that guy. Maybe you could go up and fight for the middleweight title. So what did you think of Chael's idea? Do you like this idea? Is this something you think that, like, did you think that this could be possible before Chael said it and everyone started talking about it? Uncle Chael, man, that guy's a fucking legend. I mean, dude, one night... And five dead bodies, Uncle Chael? Damn, man, you burying them in the desert just like me. I'm putting them in there one at a time. Street Judas first. But, yeah, Uncle Chael, he makes a very good point, Mike. Everybody was talking about Usman fighting Adesanya and this and that. And uh, Usman's a bad matchup for Adesanya. Dude, I'm a bad matchup for Usman. I beat him at our last fight, Madison Square Garden. So why can't I go up and fight Adesanya? You know, I won't have to cut one pound. I'll just wake up and fight my natural weight, how much I weigh. So... That guy cannot stop what I do, Mike, and I, and I, I truly believe that wholeheartedly. He's, he's good at cardio kickboxing, but if I want to do cardio kickboxing, I'll, I'll, I'll get a Tybo video and, and start doing Tybo in my living room and practicing that cardio kickboxing. But, but I do American wrestling, man, and this is mixed martial arts and blending the martial arts, and no one can blend the martial arts like me. I put them all together. I'm a world-class striker and, and AA-plus Olympic-level world-class wrestler, so I'm unbeatable in that style. You know, over the next couple of years, people are going to see just how how impossible it is to stop that style. You you, you know what? Uh, you make a great point about about the the wrestling now because we're seeing it all over the place. We're seeing Bryce Mitchell is a perfect example who fought on that same card. The chain wrestling that this guy puts together, like it it's that style you guys have, where if you can't get the first take done, you get the second. If you can't get the second, you get the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. It just keeps coming and. We're seeing some of these guys like Bryce is great. Nick Maximoff's another guy who's implementing that style and being very successful at that. Like, so you kind of saw the writing on the wall that eventually this style is going to take over and it's, it's almost impossible to stop, especially if you have the cardio. So this is something you saw a mile away, but are you seeing it more prevalent now? Are you seeing some of these other guys finding success off of this cycle as well? I mean, definitely people are learning and they're trying to game script and blueprint off of the Colby chaos Covington uh, career, you know, the, what I've been able to accomplish, the things I've been able to do, and the style I've been able to fight. So, of course, a lot of people see they're like, they're like, yeah, you know, maybe I could do that. You know, maybe if Kobe's doing it, let me try it. So, you know, that's 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 always going to be a beautiful skill that is going to come to the martial arts, and it's going to see if it can beat power, if it can beat speed, if it can beat this and that. So, it's amazing to test the elements and see which one's going to be the best one and prevail. Just in terms of like the the styles matchup, like you and it, like yeah, that style against Adesanya, because people say like, here's the blueprint. All you gotta do is take Izzy down, and people have tried, and people haven't really been able to get him down. His takedown defense has 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 held up in some of these fights. So from a from a martial arts perspective, you must like how confident do you feel matching up with Izzy? No, I feel extremely confident. I, I would say that I would have to be a a pretty good sized favorite over him. Like that's honestly how I feel. Like, he can't stuff my shots. And if he stuffs it once, it, there's going to be at least 20 or 30, you know, I'm already in the records. I think for like second most in the division for in the history for takedowns. And, and I'm not even trying. You, you see, after my last fight with George wasn't even break a sweat. I was still bouncing around the octagon, telling him to lick my nuts and telling him that, you know, he's still my little son and, and I wasn't even breathing hard and he's being held up by two people. So my style against Izzy, like, you know, I just he was getting taken out by Robert Whitaker. That guy's never taken a wrestling class, let alone a division one, you know, uh, high level 
uh, wrestling collegiate class, you know, led by, you know, a master instructor like Dan Gable, who's one of the legends and the forefounders for, for American wrestling. So when you learn that type of style and that type of mentality, there's just not going to be a person alive that's going to be able to stop you. You know, I used to dig ditches for fun just to get a workout, Mike. Like, I've done some some very – I go to deep, deep lengths to to really push myself and push my body and mind to to be ready for any opportunity in any fight. And, and uh, there's just not a lot of people that can keep up with that. And, and I know Izzy's not one of them. He's When the tough gets going, you saw what happened in his last fight or a couple fights ago when he fought Blockowitz. He just he couldn't stop it when when guys keep attacking him. So I know I could do the same, and I know it's a great fight, and hopefully the UFC will give me the opportunity. Adesanya said June July he'd like to return after the the win over Whitaker and Cannonier stopped Derek Brunson. Everyone feels like he's the guy, but if you go back and kind of look through Cannonier's career, he's had a hard time bouncing back, like getting back very quickly. Adesanya seems to want to get right in there. We've seen. Fighters in the past kind of jump over the number one contender to go to Izzy's schedule. So if Air is not ready for some reason and that phone rings June, July, that work for you? You're in? Of course. You know, I was ready to go for May, for April, for, for March still. You know, I didn't have a scratch for my last fight. My last fight was flawless victory. So, you know, of course, July International Fight Week is the big pay-per-view the UFC does in Vegas. So that's perfect timing to get back in there. So hopefully they can put one of these fights together that, that I would like one of the biggest and best fights the UFC can put together and do business wise on their end. So July, that's perfect. I, I would love to do it. And, and uh, hopefully Hunter Campbell hits up my phone soon. So if we can't do Poirier, we can't do Adesanya. I'm wondering what really makes sense right now, unless you just want to wait because most people are saying give Colby the winner of the Burn Shamaya fight at UFC 273 in Jacksonville because that sets up a number one contender fight. Winner gets Usman. Doesn't matter what happened in the first two fights. Like whoever wins that fight gets the fight with Usman. Maybe that's the direction. Maybe it gets you back to Kamara quicker. I know how badly you want that fight, but I mean, what does make sense for you? Like, if it's neither of those two fights, if it's not Usman, what does make sense for you? Um, you know, that's what makes sense for me and what makes sense for the UFC, like, business-wise, just putting the biggest and best fights together. Dustin's that fight. You know, millions and millions of fans want to see that. Like, he said it's on site. He said a lot of these things to the, to the media. So that fight does good business for the UFC. But if they have another big fight in mind, I'm here and I'm available. They, I'm open. CCI, Colby Covington Incorporated is open for business. So, you know, I, I got a lot of respect for, for Hunter Campbell. I call him the face that runs the place because that guy truly is like the face behind closed doors that's running that place and making sure the UFC operates like a well-oiled machine like it does. So whenever he calls my phone, you know, I want to put the biggest and best fights and whatever they have, I'll be ready to respond to the call. I'm, I'm trying to get a new contract. I'm trying to fight – and earn that right, Mike, to be a lifetime UFC fighter. Like, lock me down long-term UFC that that you guys know you're riding for me for life because I want to li- ride with them for life, man. I love the UFC brand, the company, and look. I mean, look at this stuff. Look what look what I have on my on my neck, on my on my wrist. You know, this is le- legitimately more than houses cost. Just sitting here on my neck and on my wrist. So, and that's thanks to the UFC giving me the opportunities, giving me a chance to create my own destiny. So it's been beautiful to to put destiny in my own hands and work hard and bank on myself. How many fights do you have left on your current deal? If you don't mind me asking, I, I got to go check, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm not sure to be honest. I have to check. I'm sure it's a few or something, but you know, it's just, they, they give you fights and sometimes they extend it every fight. So I'm not really sure. I just, I love being a UFC fighter and, and, and everything that, that comes with it. So I can tell you, we're just getting started. So you want that you want that Bret Hart ninety six deal where they sign you for twenty years? Like let's get get one of those deals in there. That's exactly what I want. You know, I want to work. I want to work for the UFC after I'm done fighting for them. You know, I want to sp- expand that brand. I love this this sport and you know the next generation of talent. Like I'm all big and, and building them up and trying to give them knowledge and pass along what's been passed to me. So. You know, I want to I want to when I'm done fighting in like five, six years, you know, I want to be able to move on and, and be a, a, a full time like UFC employee. We, we talked about we mentioned Bret Hart. You said face that runs the place. So it got me thinking of wrestling. And I know you're a big wrestling fan, at least back when I was watching wrestling. Scott Hall, Razor Ramon has has passed away, man. Some some sad stuff. How did how did you react to that news? Yeah, it was it was tough, man. It was hard to see, man. 
gone too soon. You know, I, I hope he rests in peace and his family condolences to his family during this trying time. But, you know, it's just, it's sad, man. You never know when the la your last day is going to be. So you have to cherish every moment you have here on, on earth and, and just be thankful to, you know, our heavenly father for just blessing us and giving us an, another day. So gone too soon, man. I, you know, I hope he's kicking up in, in, in heaven and just, you know, I, I hope he rests in peace. Just up there oozing machismo uh, as he did in, in, in the WWF. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Uh, it's always great coming out. I saw you look at your watch. You probably have shit to do, so <laughs> I don't want to keep you any yeah. longer, my man. So uh, yeah. appreciate the time. Any Anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap up here? I just want to say biggest shout out to my tailor, Luigi Girardi. The guy just changed my my suit game, you know. It just he did so much for me that I can't thank him enough for for what he's done for me, you know. It's just just it's been such a pleasure to work with him and have him, you know, on team Colby Covington Incorporated. So hit up Luigi Girardi if you're looking for a fine Italian thread of suit and if you need a wedding, you got an event to go to, anything. That guy's the man and and shout out obviously to Bang Energy. You know, we just created this new drink, booze, and this shit's the future of sports drinks. Like, just no no sugar, like all the right amino acids and, and vitamins that you need, and it's overtaking all those other energy drinks that have all the sugar in them. So shout out Jack Walk, booze, and, and Bang Energy. Awesome, man. Congratulations on the win. Uh, appreciate the time as always, and hopefully we see you back in there uh, ASAP, my man, to build upon this momentum. I hope so.